The United States is the world's most enduring example of democracy. In this moment, the nation confronts historic challenges and opportunities for governance and engagement. Stories in Democracy, in partnership with SNOA Libraries and the Daily Herald, explores the issues facing our communities and the future of democracy through a series of personal conversations with the congressional representatives of Snohomish and Island Counties. Welcome to Stories in Democracy, a partnership between Snow Owl Libraries and the Daily Herald. I'm Lois Langer Thompson, the Executive Director of Snow Owl Libraries. Joining me is John Bauer, the Editorial Page Editor of the Daily Herald newspaper. Together, we will discuss the future of our American democracy and representative government and explore opportunities for governance and engagement as the nation confronts historic challenges. Our guest today is Congresswoman Susan Delbeni, who represents Washington State's first congressional district, which spans from Northeast King County to the Canadian border and includes parts of King, Snohomish, Skagit, and Whatcom counties. The Congresswoman was first sworn into the House of Representatives in November 2012. She currently serves as the Vice Chair on the House Ways and Means Committee, which is at the forefront of debate on our tax code, healthcare reform, trade deals, and retirement security. Congresswoman Delbeni also serves on the Select Revenue Measures and Trade Subcommittees and is the chair of the Forward Thinking New Democratic Coalition and co-chair of the Women's High Tech Caucus, Internet of Things Caucus, and Dairy Caucus. Congresswoman Delbeni's district includes seven of Snow Isle Library's 23 community libraries, as well as several of our neighboring library systems. Welcome, Congresswoman Delbeni. Thank you. And over to you for our first question. Thanks, and yes, welcome, Congresswoman. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I, I want to start with uh, a, a little background on yourself, and and specifically uh, how and why you came to to be in Congress. Well, it's a great question because I'm a pretty unlikely member of Congress. Um, I never thought I would be. Um, engaged in politics uh, or government. Um, I was a scientist. Uh, that was my passion. Um, I came out of out of college with a biology degree, started my career in doing immunology research. Um, and then I spent most of my professional life um, in the technology sector. Uh, I ran for office really because when I had the opportunity to think about what I wanted to do next. I really wanted to give back because my family had gone through a lot of struggles when I was growing up. Um, I feel like people made investments in me that gave me the opportunity to have the career that I did, be in a position to take care of my family. And um, those investments have been harder and harder to come by for young people growing up today. Um, I didn't graduate from college with um, unsurmountable debt, but many um, young people today have. And so um, I wanted to see what we could do to, to make sure that young people today had the same opportunities that I did. Um, I know our middle class has eroded over decades. And so um, I got engaged in nonprofit, got engaged in policy as a result and figured um, if I wanted to make a difference, I should be willing to stand up and share my voice. And so I uh, kind of surprisingly, I ran for office and here I am today. So I think the one big takeaway from this is anyone um, can be engaged and involved. It doesn't have to be a lifetime career for someone. I think we all have a chance to participate in our communities in different ways. Um, and we should look forward to those opportunities as they come up. Thanks. Thanks. That's a um, great story about um, that sometimes what seems like an unlikely path uh, toward an election and representing uh, your community. I wonder, as you've now been in Congress for a while, what keeps you in it? What keeps you motivated and inspired every day to go to work? Um, knowing that I can make a difference. I think that's really the knowing that if you want to help see change to make sure that everyone has opportunity across our country. Um, I want to be part of that. I want to be doing my part. And so that's what really motivated me to run in the first place, but continues to motivate me today um, to make a difference. It takes all of us and we all have a role to play. And I want to make sure that I'm doing my part to help represent our incredible community. I, I want to ask you uh, 
kind of about the the current atmosphere in Congress. And and you know there have been uh, some definite successes, but there's also uh, continued debate and 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 uh, just kind of a glacial pace to other issues. Um, what are your feelings of, about that? Um, uh, that and and even recognizing that there's um, there isn't consensus yet uh, among Democrats on some issues. Well, you know, when I came to Congress starting at the end of 2012, the atmosphere was very divisive. Folks were talking about it uh, how this was a divisive time in our government. Um, unfortunately, it's only gotten worse uh, over this over this period of time. Um, divisions have intensified. Uh, I think that that has become even more pronounced in the last four years where we've had a president who pushed to create division. Um, I think people generally want to see governance work. They want to see people come together. Um, I have a purple district and D, you know, with every kind of political point of view possible represented in my district. And I think that th that's been really important to hear different voices, to let your ideas be challenged. And um, and as a result, I think that it makes you a better legislator. And I think to be a good legislator, we have to listen, understand. That doesn't mean you can't disagree. Yeah, we will disagree, but at least let your ideas be challenged. Um, and make the right decision for the country. And in the end, I think that's really what we need to see is people putting country first, um, not party. And I think that would help us uh, kind of bridge the gaps that we see today. But it's been a very challenging environment and right now an extremely divisive Congress. Could you um, talk about that a little bit? I wonder if you could talk about how you and your staff working there uh, your concerns around democracy and representative government. What what concerns do you have? And then, if you could also think uh, talk a little bit as a scientist, how you approach uh, this time in history and how you see where we are as a country. Well, um, I am very concerned about our democracy today. I think we all should be. Um, we have challenges with folks even acknowledging what the truth is, um, acknowledging what happened, for example, on January 6th and being able to speak honestly about it. Um, we have misinformation and folks uh, um, uncertain about where the information is coming from and, and trust probably underlying all of that is made it very divisive and very challenging. Um, and we've had elective leaders who've actively undermined the faith and trust in our electoral system. Um, we have folks trying to take away access to the ballot across the country. Um, so that's about as fundamental as it gets. And uh, these are concerns that are shared across our communities. So um, if we don't make sure that we're participating and making a difference, we could be in a place where our elections aren't deciding um, who our representatives are. We have others kind of deciding the outcome of an election. So this is a critical time for people to be engaged and involved. And when you talk about this in terms of the, the what it means for us, um, how this critical time in our country, this will be something that we all look back on, how we responded. Um, you know, the everyone has said, you know, democracy is a fragile thing um, and it's important thing. You got to work hard um, to keep our democracy. And that means we all have to stand up for kind of our underlying values, but also um, stand up for the basic principles of democracy. And that means um, and I think voting rights are probably some of the most fundamental rights um, to making sure that we have that representative democracy. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm kind of continuing along that line, um, I wonder, I, I'd like to hear from you what you would like to see from your constituents b beyond just getting out to vote. What, uh, what do you want to see them, uh, how do you want to see them participate in, in government and, and what would you like to be hearing from them? Well, I do think I'll reemphasize again, um, we do need people to vote. We do need people to be engaged and involved in our democracy. Um, we, th we either thrive or struggle together across our communities. I think the pandemic has really showed everyone that, how important it is to come together and help each other out. Um, I think that we also, um, it's so important that we make sure that 
everyone in our, our community needs the opportunity to succeed, to feel safe where they live, to have healthy food to eat. Um, and we have to make sure that we also respect each other and respect the diversity in our communities. Um, most of all, I think that people do have to participate. Participate means voting, but it also means um, being engaged and involved in communities, helping make decisions, working together um, with neighbors and others, uh, listening to people who disagree with you and listening to their views and trying to understand that. Let your ideas be challenged. Um, that's really kind of how we are strong going forward. And I think sometimes we sit in our camps today, um, folks hang out with folks that agree with them. Um, and uh, and I encourage folks, and it's a great thing about um, the the first congressional district is you get to have meet with folks who have differing points of view and you learn from that. You don't always have to agree, but you learn. And I think that would be incredibly helpful for all our, our communities, for us, for constituents to engage, listen to others and um, understand where they're coming from. Just to follow up, uh, what do you see as the most effective way for constituents to, to share those opinions and views with you? It could be any way, I guess, okay. uh, you know, folks, right into my office. Um, we meet with members of our community. Folks will come to a town hall. Um, there are so many ways people share their views and their stories. Um, that's also the information, you know, the, uh, it's not just the engagement with the federal government, it's engagement with all levels of government. And so through the work that um, we do, not only directly with constituents, but also talking to local elected leaders, school boards, others. It's another chance to hear, the, hear those stories, hear the challenges that folks are facing. Um, and But it is important that everyone participates and speaks up because sometimes you hear from folks who are louder, um, but they're not necessarily <laughs> representative of the broad community. And so we need everyone to be engaged and I also think it's important for students to be engaged. I have the opportunity to go to schools, um, mostly it's the schools throughout our district, but I'm many times engaging um, with high school students who are learning about government. Um, I do think that everyone needs to kind of understand how government works, understand civics, um, so that we um, they understand kind of the role that they can play. And so it's everywhere from the educational standpoint all the way through the day-to-day -day activities that folks do um, to participate in their communities and to share their stories because we can't address issues that we're not aware of. Um, and so I try very hard to get out and hear from folks, but it's okay. important that people take that opportunity to, um, to express their views as well. Yeah, and I uh, appreciate all the time you spend out in the district when you're here, and it is quite a breath of miles that you travel, but I have seen you out in lots of spaces and appreciate that. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about an issue that is very important to all of us, especially in the library, and that's broadband access, and uh, how that, your the work you have done for that, and, and some of the background of why um, that is so important, right, for people to have access to the resources, but also the information when we're talking about what is truth and how you get your information. So could you just talk a little bit about how you got involved in that and where you see uh, the work going? Um, absolutely. Technology has been transformational in allowing us to share information, to communicate. Um, we've definitely seen that um, even more during the pandemic. But it's also highlighted the disparities that are out there, that the disparities in terms of access to information. Um, students who don't aren't weren't able to take online classes because they don't have broadband, um, or workers who weren't able to work from home because they didn't have that technology access. Um, my district has been a very unique district. We have, yeah, you know, this is one of the techno global technology hubs. Um, right here, but you can also be in parts of my district where we don't have um, broadband or even good cell service. And that's definitely true in Eastern Snohomish County, uh, where if you drive out Highway 530, for example, or parts of Highway 2, you'll be in places where you don't have good cell service at all. And of course, the access to broadband is really hard. And when we talk about access to broadband, it's the ability to do video conferencing 
not just get email, because that's really the standard today for education, for access to information, for work. So it wasn't that long ago um, that, you know, people relied on communication to make a phone call um, and didn't have cell service. But today, in terms of making sure that we really have equity and access, um, this is critically important. And we've, you know, we made sure that we got, um, we, when we, when we got electricity out to all of our communities, we made sure that people had phone service, landlines out to our communities across the country. And we still have not made sure that we have broadband everywhere. So, um, it absolutely needs to happen. It's a huge part of the, the infrastructure legislation that just was passed um, because this really is transform transformational to opportunity, but also to your point on access to information. And there are a whole other set of issues in terms of ac access to information that are critical because we know that making sure that even, even if you have access, that you are getting information, you're getting unbiased information. Um, there's a whole nother set of issues we face with technology in terms of how algorithms may push misinformation around, um, the ability for bad actors to significantly distort information. Um, these are all part of the issues we have to address when we talk about technology. And so there's fundamental access, but there's also um, making sure that we protect civil rights, civil liberties, um, constitutional um, rights in a digital world. And I'd say we're behind there. Susan, you're anticipating my questions, which <laughs> which is good. Uh, I, I do want to ask you uh, uh, about your priorities uh, for the rest of the year and, and the coming year, uh, the, the rest of the term. Uh, what what are you, are you intending to focus on? And, and also, if you could speak to uh, how you make your choices as to what what you're going to emphasize, what you're going to support. Absolutely. Uh, one just quick point on on the broadband side, um, because Lois is here too. I just want to highlight the critical role that libraries have played, mm -hmm. especially in um, our rural communities. Um, for also, affordability where there might be access, but people can't afford access. People don't always realize how critical libraries have been to our communities to providing that essential access. Um, so thank you for that. And we need to continue to make sure um, we support our libraries and the work that they do there. Um, you know, going forward, I have a, a lot of things I want to do. Um, I think what number one, if there's one thing across our region and across my district that I hear from folks, they want to see governance work. They want to see us uh, debate issues, um, you know, come up, Congress come together and make decisions and move forward. Um, I hear that from folks of all political persuasions. And, um, and I think fundamentally that's important for us, not only in making sure that people continue to have faith in our democracy, but also showing that we can help our communities and make those long-term investments that really are transformational. Um, the infrastructure legislation we just passed long-term investment that's transformational. Um, I We started with the expanded child tax credit, um, getting checks out to families to help them take care of their children. This has been uh, critically important. Over 3 million kids across the country have been lifted out of poverty since those checks started going out last July. We need to keep that going. A huge uh, a priority of mine is to make sure we continue that. I'd like to see the expanded child tax credit made permanent. If we're really going to cut childhood poverty, we're not going to do it in just a, a few months. Um, it's a long-term investment. And that long-term investment means incredible change in terms of opportunities for our kids, better outcomes, healthier kids, um, better opportunities um, for the workforce going forward. These long-term investments truly do give us an incredible return. And when you asked about kind of how I think about what we need to do, I think it is important for us to think not only about what investments we're making as legislators, but what is the return that we're trying to get? And I worry sometimes um, in government, folks have been more short-term thinkers. What can I do today that, so someone can see a result tomorrow? And while that's important, some of the best investments we've made have been long-term investments that help us over decades, um, investments in education, investments in infrastructure, where we you know, 
for example, um, investing in a, in the US-2 trestle, right, to make sure that that's in a strong place. That's not just something that would help people today. That's something that would help our communities for decades to come. Uh, so that's why when we look at what we're doing in legislation going forward, it's important, I think, that we also have a long-term view, um, which I think has been lost a little bit in government today. And that we see if what we're what we wanted to do is working. It, are we really helping families? Uh, to me, the the issue, the primary issue I ran for office was to make sure that kids had opportunities going forward. Um, how are we doing there? Child tax credits a, a huge uh, piece of that puzzle, but also issues of childcare, um, making sure that we continue to support innovation and opportunity because that's it's been so huge for our district making sure that we're supporting rural communities and urban communities. Another um, place where if we're really gonna have opportunity, it can't just be in certain geographic locations. We need to see that everywhere. And addressing climate because here we are in our region, we've had a heat dome, we've had uh, agricultural products that, that have been, uh, crops that have been devastated by that. We've had flooding, we've had drought, we've had wildfires. We've had everything. I think we've seen that for our community. When we talk about long-term investment, there's another place um, that's so important. So I could go on and on um, because there are a lot of things we need to do, but I guess I'll, I'll stop there for right now. Thank you. We uh, wish you well in all of those. Yeah. I wonder if we could just pivot a little bit as we get ready to close out and um, to a little bit more personal and ask you what sustains you through this time period and through Ed, the work that you do. How do you sustain yourself and your leadership? Um, just knowing that I can make a difference. I think that that really is a huge driver for me, knowing that um, we're not going to address the, the challenges that we face if we're all not jumping in there doing our part. And this is an incredibly important time for our country. It's an important time for the world. And, uh, and so I'm sustained by knowing that I can help make a difference. Um, I don't wanna be sitting back watching. I wanna be part of that process. And also by the incredible community that I represent, the, all of the people who are engaged and involved, they inspire me and that helps me do, uh, do my job in the other Washington. So um, it's all of that together. And then, of course, I wouldn't be a librarian and this wouldn't be Stories in Democracy if I didn't ask you what podcast or book you're recommending right now. Well, um, I listen uh, to a lot of information, um, both online and offline. I guess if I'm going to pick a book right now that I think uh, would be a good recommendation, it would be These Truths by Jill Lepore. Um, it's a history book, um, which I think is important because I think we all understand um, our history. I think it informs us going forward. It talks about the challenges we faced in the past and how we got through them, which I think is also important as we look at the challenges we address today. Um, Walter Isaacson, who's also been an accomplished author himself, um, was talking about the book and he said it accomplishes the grand task of telling us what we need to know about our past in order to be good citizens today. So, um, and I think sometimes we folks have a selective view of our history. Um, so this is, uh, I, I think this would be, is a good foundational um, book to help folks really understand where we came from, where we are today and help us make decisions going forward. I can uh, uh, second that recommendation. It's a terrific book and uh, would be a great gift for anyone in your <laughs> friends. So, um, thank you, Congresswoman Delbeni. We called this Stories in Democracy, and I think you have exemplified this as well, your own story of why you got involved in representative government and the stories that you told today um, about our future and where we're going and thinking about how the stories today are what tell our stories into the future. And we really want to thank you for your leadership, uh, the time you spend in this community, representing this community in, in Washington, D.C., and we appreciate you and your leadership. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you yes, so much. Thank you.